Welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green. Just kidding, he's on vacation. <laughs> I'm your host, Brady Gaster, today. Mm -hmm. And with me, I have my friend, Mikkel, from the uh, Service Fabric team. Uh, I used to work with Mikkel when we were both in Visual Studio. Um, he's one of those awesome people who uh, really liked building the tools for the service, but he liked the service so much, he actually went <laughs> over to the service. <laughs> so if you want to learn any, anything about Service Fabric, Mikkel's probably a great guy to reach out to because he knows the tools and the service. And we'll put your Twitter handle in the uh, show notes down below yep. so we can get in touch with you. Sure. Um, real quick intro, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we've talked about this, done quite a few shows on it. Uh, back in November, uh, we had this awesome conference in New York City called Connect. When we were at Connect, Corey Sanders did a, a great uh, general session on application modernization with uh, Azure. And uh, Mikkel was uh, one of the guys that helped him put the presentation of the demo together. And we kind of collaborated a little bit on it. And what we wanted to do was to add the uh, this particular uh, set of code to the, uh, I guess you'd say the demo set that we've got for mm -hmm. the Smart Hotel 360 yep. site. Um, while we're talking about Smart Hotel, I want to go ahead and pull up the uh, campaign page. It's out on Azure.com. And um, what we've done is we've finally gotten all the videos that you've seen us record out here, all the way down here at the bottom. And we've got links to the different uh, repositories, one of which is a repository that uh, Mikkel and I created. And here's kind of a, a, a kind of a diagram of everything that we've got. We're actually going to be taking this show and putting this show down below. Uh, maybe by the time this show comes out, we'll already have it out there. Um, but if not, you'll you'll see it show up there eventually. What's the um, URL to get to this, please? The URL to get to this, um, we put it right here. I don't have it sh shortened yet, but you can see it's azure.microsoft.com forward slash campaigns forward slash smart hotel 360. So that's how you can get to this. And while we're talking about this, I have to do a shameless plug. Um, if you're going to be at the Dev Intersections conference uh, down in Orlando at the uh, end of March, uh, one thing I want to say is that we're actually going to be doing a workshop where we talk about how you can bring your existing .NET investments to the cloud. We're going to talk about things like AKS, containers, service fabric, everything. So if App you're going to- App services. App all services, good stuff. all good stuff. Yep. So if you're interested, uh, we've done this once or twice. I can't remember how many times we've actually done this workshop. Maybe once together, but I've done it at least twice. He's done it quite yeah. a bit. Um, and he's done the session that we're going to talk about today a couple of times since then as well. So uh, if you're going to be at Dev Intersections, we'd love to see you at the workshop. Uh, if you're not going to be at the workshop, just stop by and introduce yourselves. Um, and cool. real quickly, we're going to do kind of a hardware change here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, disconnect and reconnect with Mikkel real quick. And we're back. So. What we're going to talk about real quick um, is kind of the things that we're going to talk about what we've already talked about. That's kind of your typical conclusion <laughs> at the end of your presentation. Um, the things that we've already talked about in the existing smart hotel stuff, we've, we've gone through uh, app service, mm -hmm. and we've talked about various ways that you can use containers, uh, uh, Azure Container Registry, uh, Azure Kubernetes Service. We've talked about all those different things. But if you want to take it kind of to the next step and you're doing something that you need high availability, or some other kinds of capabilities, or if you just want to bring an existing .NET application, .NET Framework application, you don't want to convert it to .NET Core yet, uh, if you want to bring that up, that's kind of when you might want to take a look at Service Fabric. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, Mikkel knows a lot more about this than I do. I'm just trying to sound smart at this point. <laughs> but, but really what this does is this sort of completes the Smart Hotel, you know, 360 kind of puzzle because there were some apps that the people in the hotel wanted to bring into the cloud and not yeah. tweak. So that's kind of where you kind of picked up and, and ran with things. Exactly, and that you know this is uh, so this is a really very uh, real scenario we see today with mm -hmm. a lot of customers. They mm -hmm. have existing uh, .NET framework applications, typically applications that center around IIS. Right. Um, so anything from web forms, WCF services, those kind of applications, which mm -hmm. is a huge investment, and those are like good line of business running applications today. That's done a lot of good for these customers. Kind of like if it's not broke. Don't fix it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but you know they might want to take these applications with them onto like a cloud journey. Right. Right. So this is where this talk about modernizing the applications comes in. But cool. it's not necessarily about you know just modernizing the application. There are other things you can start modernizing. We actually hmm. without going into the code itself. Right. Okay. So so it's a way that we could actually modernize the application without actually changing the code that we've already invested and in written. So that that will that will be an optimal situation. Like right. the closer you can get to that, right. the less intrusive to the actual code you have that right. that migration is, That's the cool. better, of course. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. Because then you just take all your existing investments and move it over. Exactly, and 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 sort of the, the progression that and and that's also how how we how we laid that out in the talk that Corey did. There's mm -hmm. like a, a progression where you sort of you know the investment you put in, you get more you get benefits back based on those. Right. Uh, so I mean, if you want to get like the full benefits of like 
scalability and high availability and reliability right. in the cloud, right. being able to do microservices right. on top of your existing applications and yeah. stuff like that, you need to do some investment. But, right. but there are small investments you can start out with. Right. Right. Like, you can take your existing applications today, like those kind of applications, the .NET Framework applications. You so say I have like a Web Forms app or a WCF app. Exactly, right. or you have those two working together in sort of like a right. three-tier application, which is actually the sample we have here. Right. Right. There's an immediate step to just move those into VMs in the cloud. Okay. Right. So you start you start moving from an on-prem data center into a cloud-based data center. Right. right. So so that's like for the folks that they want to touch IIS, they want to low-level configure everything. Maybe you have some comm components that you're still calling into or mm -hmm. some WCF services, and you want to have that like tight control. It's not a physical box that you can go touch, but you can actually RDP into, into your VM in the cloud and do all the things that you're already familiar with. Exactly, right. and you get all the infrastructure knobs for you to sort of you know stitch things together the right. way that you have want to. Right. Either based on you know requirements or how things you know compatibility that you can sort of get to, uh, but also it's just like it's a small investment. It's a first step to sort of modernizing the way you uh, just run your operations right. around your service, right? right? right. So mm -hmm. lots of good stuff in Azure that helps you around uh, around that mm -hmm. that that scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course you can move on from there, uh, like going into you know. VMs in Azure doesn't require a lot of your code. You just basically redeploy. Right. Um, but then you can start doing containers instead. Right. And when containers are, are interesting is because then you start to you start to be able to take the benefit of using orchestration or container orchestration. Okay. So um, for for those for for those of us who have have basically taken two Docker images or two Docker containers and put them into Kubernetes together and they, mm -hmm. and they talk to each other just because it works. Yep. You know, could you kind of explain to us what you mean when you say orchestration? Like, like what's that yeah. you know, for a layman? So, so the basics of orchestration is that your application and the way that they run uh, and the way that you get reliability and mm -hmm. scalability with your application is that there's an underlying set of VMs. We always we end up running on right. well, we actually end up running on physical hardware, right. but we sort of already skipped that point. Now it's just yeah, but those are we those end are, up on VMs. But those are is, like <laughs> machines that are as big as this room, somewhere safe. Yeah, exactly. In a large and building. Those yeah. are us to take. You know, those, right. those are up to us to handle. Like Microsoft is being the cloud provider, right. but but there are a set of VMs in there somewhere. Okay. So with all these orchestration technologies like Kubernetes and Service Fabric and and and, and others out there. Basically, they you 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 bring a pool of machines as your sort of the compute power that is behind whatever okay. you want to run. Okay. And because you have these workloads well defined in either a standard like container format, right? Uh, UCI, the Open Container uh, Definition, I think it's called. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where Docker is one of the implementations of right. those, um, you are able to easily move these workloads around across that you know compute sort of platform you bring together with this set of VMs. Okay, okay. So really what the orchestrator does is it, it gives you uh, availability and resiliency in, in the case that any given node goes down or has to be taken down because right. of maintenance and stuff like that. Okay. It's very easy for the orchestrator to move that workload, the service that they container to a different node. Okay. And well, it just does that for you. Makes sense. That makes right. sense. Okay. So comparing to the IS scenario where you had like maybe two web servers Got that it. you have to run right. and you probably run both hot, like you just load balance your load across right. them. So right. if one goes down, the other have to serve okay. everything. Yeah. In this other scenario, you can actually just run one. And even when something happened, okay. the orchestrator will make sure that another instance of that application comes up somewhere else where it's actually able to run it. Okay, and the benefit of that, like those, those orchestration engines that exist, Kubernetes or service traffic or what have you, those exist so that you don't have to do that yourself. You don't have to worry about how all that stuff works. Yep. You're just you're just left to make your app and put your app in the orchestrator and let it do its thing. Exactly. So that's that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, we've talked a little bit about this stuff. Let's see how you could do. Uh, let's see how you could uh, scale some stuff out using using what we've already built out. Sure. Yeah. So let me let me start out by showing you how the Visual Studio tools really helps you and uh, makes this really, really easy for you. Yes, of course. So what I've done is I have, we have an application sample and that is actually part of a GitHub repo. So let's just start with the GitHub repo. Cool. So you can see we have here the, on GitHub we have, uh, in the Microsoft organization, we have the Smart Hotel 360-internal-booking.apps. Uh, you can reach it from the main repo from the whole yep. Smart Hotel mm -hmm. uh, 360 mm -hmm. solution. Uh, so basically, this this repository, uh, the story that we're trying to tell, or the context we're putting this technology into here is, um, you have this this let's call it a front desk booking system Makes in your sense. hotel. It's basically where you go and you know you check in people, you check them out and stuff like that. 
uh, which is an application that's probably been running on a few servers behind someone's disk, mm -hmm. or maybe even moving to a real data set at one point in yep. time. Yep. Um, but you want to move that into the cloud, and you want to start, you know, gaining some of the benefits that we just discussed. Got it. So if we just uh, in the repo, we have this readme doc that sort of describes the application, how it works. But it's 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 a very typical scenario. I think a lot of you would would recognize. Those are web forms with front end. Uh, to basically, you know, render the HTML for the application, the booking application. There's a WCF service uh, which will give you, you know, which will feed the front end with all the data that you need and yep. uh, do other stuff. And then it's backed by a SQL database. Got so it. very typical, like three, three, three tier scenario. Right. A lot of people will see. So, so or the main N tier for those of us that believe in more than three. Sure, you can add more if you want to. That's true. Yeah, and that's when we get into microservices, and it's end of the nth tier. <laughs> yeah, tiers and microservices, but that's a different discussion. That's a different ballgame. But yeah, 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 anyways. Sorry. People probably don't consider that tiers. I don't that's know. Tier. But like, anyways. <laughs> like, at that point, you're, like, you've got one tier that is your microservice layer. Yeah, yeah. I would sort of think of it like okay. that. But, you know, and even though, yeah, even the services themselves can have tiers. But that's, that's, a, a, that's a different conversation. Let's, not, let's yeah. not go there now. It's more theoretical. Yeah. Okay, so the diagram I just showed you, how does it actually look in Visual Studio? So this is my solution. This is probably a solution that was made, like, uh, a few years back, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it runs well today. And I can go and debug, and you know, an IS Express uh, locally as I would today. I have local SQL DB and all those good stuff. Right. Now, Visual Studio has built in uh, uh, great tools to help you start uh, getting these applications into containers, and you know, with the goal of running the orchestrators yeah. either in the cloud or somewhere else. And the very simple thing we can do for a service fabric scenario here is I have my web front end, and I can simply just right click on the projects in my solution. And I can choose to add uh, Docker support for Service Fabric. Oh. So what the tooling will do for me is actually add the required files, the definition files I need to describe how this is going to end up running in the orchestrator, oh. the files that is needed to describe how this is going to be packed as a container. Uh, so you know, so these simple tooling tricks just you know get you started very very quickly with those things. Now is that is that a tool that's built into the uh, one, I was actually just in the VS installer this morning. Yeah. Um, is that in the VS installer, is that the Azure workload, or is this a second extension that I have to pull down from the It's part of the Azure workload. Cool, okay, so if you but just click on Azure, you yes. should be okay. You should be okay. The exact version I'm showing you here is a preview of a component in there. Okay. So you need to find the service fabric tooling preview. It's out on the block to be able to get this. Okay, okay. Uh, which gives you this specific feature that I'm showing you right now. Cool, awesome, awesome. Um, so, so, so what, what, what actually happened to my project here is I, I, I need this Docker file uh, for my specific application. So this is my web, web forms application here. Mm -hmm. So this Docker file basically describes how to wrap this uh, web forms app inside a container. So there's a base image, there's a Microsoft ASP.NET base image that I'm going to use. Okay. That's a Docker image that Microsoft provides. Cool. So these Docker images typically like a layers on top of each other, right? Right. right. And you can go back and find from uh, from Docker Hub, there is uh, there is good documentation. You can actually go and see the repository, and you can see the Docker file that builds that image. You Got can it. sort of trace back all the stuff that ends up in your image that way. That makes sense. And so. and really, what that is, I mean, I I talked to you about this and Shane mm -hmm. Boyer about this at one point, and I said, well, how do I know what's going to get you know how do I know what's going to be on that yeah. on that container? Well, doesn't matter. That's like the baseline for you to get started. I was like, well, what's in there? And he goes. Think about it like this. When you do .NET new, mm -hmm. you know, Razor, yep. that's a template. Somebody else wrote that. It's going to get you started. This is really just a Docker image that gets you started. Yes. So you don't have to bootstrap everything from the ground up. Yeah. Makes sense? Yep. Okay. It Great. makes sense. And mm -hmm. you can see from the, there's actually only one thing we're doing here. So the, 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 uh, the arg and the work directory we're going to put in uh, are basically you know, just parameters being used when we build the container. But the yep. only thing we're actually doing is we're just copying our published output into the container. Got it. That's all we have to do to actually publish this web so app. So you just take all the DLLs and the files that VS outputs and you just push those over to the container and now you've got everything in a box. Yep. Cool. I like That's it. it. That's cool. So Visual Studio gives you that and then it gives you uh, what we call service and application manifest as well. Okay. So those are the files that you would need to hand over to Service Fabric. So Service Fabric know how to run this. Got it. Like it describes. So this container, once you go ahead and build it, you have to do the container dance with putting it into a, a registry or right. repository. Right. Uh, no, it's a container registry, sorry. Container registry, <laughs> yes. Container registry. And, and in the registry, there are repositories. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this gets interesting. So, yeah. so you, would, you, would use, uh, you would use a thing like uh, Azure Container Registry, which gives right. you a great feature set for you know, uh, having private registries, mm -hmm. you know, securing your containers, mm -hmm. even integrating with security compliance tooling. So whenever you build 
Uh, whenever you build containers, have repositories in there, you can you know, get, be warned about you know, vulnerabilities to containers and stuff like that. So there's, like, there's a lot, lot of great features around there to help you, you know, manage the security and compliance around your containers once you start building them. And then you could use team services to pull the, the images out of the registry and put them into uh, some sort of an orchestration. Yeah, so you would say like, like if you have a typical setup with you know, some continuous integration or build pipeline, right. deployment pipeline, typically you would take your code, you will build it, and you will sort of uh, dump your artifacts somewhere, which right. you will then go and publish. It's basically the same the fact that we dump the container as an artifact into the container registry. Got it. And that's where we go and pull it from when we okay. have to deploy it. Makes sense. So, so you, got, you have to have somewhere to hold the images before you deploy the images. Yeah, I think there's an old ITIL term called DSL, like a definitive software library. Yeah. So that's basically, that's where you can go and run your stuff. Yeah, that's right? cool. It's that's the cool. same thing. That makes it's sense. That's good. Different words. Whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so, but but Visual Studio just gives you all of this, and you're you're pretty well on the way here. And 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 once I've done it, I need to go and do this with my WCF application as well. Okay. But once I've actually done this, I'm able to go ahead and I can debug things locally, see them running in containers, and all those kind of things. So really, what you're doing is you're containerizing your web app, and then you're containerizing your WCF app. Yeah. Your WCF app probably has a different base image. Then you take both of those containers, put them into I'm going to use abbreviations ACR um, mm -hmm. as a container registry. Yeah. And then you would use some sort of a CI/CD to take them out of there and then deploy them into a fabric. Yes. Cool. Correct. Makes sense. So if I just move along to a different solution I have uh, where I actually set this up. Now I have containerized both of these applications and, 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 and the stuff that you typically do then once you move things into containers is mm -hmm. we really want to make our containers uh, immutable. So, okay. so the idea is once I have a container, it doesn't change. Right. right? It's, right. it's the build output that right. I created. Right. But typically when we go and run you know, a web application. There might be configuration and stuff like that we need to pair in. There's like typical uh, connection whatever. strings to a SQL database, right. blah, right. blah, blah, blah. Right. Right. Tons of stuff. Yeah, and there are, there are different ways that we can do this. You know, there's uh, web transform config that we're going to do. Okay. Um, what's a little bit problematic with web transform in this scenario is that it actually generates the configuration unbuilt, <sighs> right? Okay. And you actually end up sort of burning that into your container okay. by following this specific process here. Okay. Um, but there are, there are ways you can build your container in a way that you actually get that configuration or run your transform when you run the container instead of doing it and build. So, so in a sense, you're parameterizing the stuff that you're getting ready to put into the container. Yes. Okay. So once the container start up, it doesn't just start up your website. It's actually right. doing the web transform config Got based it. on the parameter it gets input, and Got then it. it starts up the application. So that helps you from a, that helps you avoid hard coding connection strings and putting them in the container. Yeah, and it, that's that's the way you can use uh, things like uh, config transformation, like Got web okay. transform. Config. Makes sense. But what you, you, I mean, so if you're very heavily dependent on that, that's definitely a route you can you explore. It's okay. get a little bit more complicated in terms of how you build your container. Got but could, what the way that we usually do configuration in containers, or we that you know, the industry sort of you know gathered around that we do configuration is two environment variables. Right. So whenever you go and run a container, it gets it picks up a set of environment variables, which is basically the configuration it would run with. Got it. Okay. So either that or through files that we can inject into the container is something we call volume mounting. Volume mounting. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when a container starts up, it would expect a whatever drive being there, and that drive we can actually map to something external that's not inside the container. Got it. So those are basically the means of getting configuration And in. my understanding of the idea of, of, of volume mounting with uh, Docker and containers is like each container has everything it needs to run, mm -hmm. but l let's say it needs to store stuff that's bigger than you want to get that, you know, yeah. that container, that image to be. You would say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to volume mount C or C to a directory or D or you have some other drive. Mm -hmm. And that way the individual Docker containers, the data is not being stored there. Yep. It's being stored on disk so that if you were to destroy that container, you don't destroy the data that goes along with it. Yep. Is that exactly. kind of the rule? Okay, yep. cool. Yeah, but then when you're in this orchestration world, you need to figure out how do you get that data right. across the different nodes that you have. Right. Okay. So okay. now you get into other, I mean, there's always okay. you know, stuff. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, but the way that we end up, so the way that we can do this in service fabric, and I'm going to show you some of the, you know, configuration stuff that you, this is, this is basically the, the definition file you hand over to the orchestrator. I mean, for, in a, in a Kubernetes world, uh, there's stuff like, you know, the Kubernetes Helm YAML files. files. Yes. There's also Helm charts you can right. use if you use Helm and Tiller. Mm -hmm. uh, in the service fabric world, there are application manifest file. Docker has a concept called Docker Compose, uh, which used to work with, uh, which, which is, uh, it's created for Swarm, Docker Swarm, right. sort of an uh, orchestration te technology that Docker created. Uh, in Service Fabric, it's called Manifest, and it's, it's an XML file. Kay. So you can see I can start parameterizing a lot of stuff in here, like stuff like the ports that my, you know, 
my WCF has an endpoint. I can parameterize the port if I want to do that. You know, I can do different parameterizations, like there's a WCF service URI that my front end needs to have. Got it. Now I can put that in through configuration and everything here. Got it. So none of these things are sort of burned into the container image now, but I hand those in as configurations. Got it. So I, I see it. so I see here that you've got um, in this resource overrides, you've got endpoints. Yeah. And then you've got endpoint name, smart hotel registration, WCF type endpoint. Yep. Or, and then you've got port and this bracket, I presume what that means is it's going to look at this parameter in the file. Correct. Got it. And you can see I have a default setting there. And what I'm also able to do is then I'm able to have a set of parameter files. So depending on the environment I go into, I can start oh. overwriting these things. You can actually see my connection string and all of those things. I have specific parameter files, so across like staging and oh, cool. production environment, stuff sense. like that. Yeah. I just feed another parameter file into this definition, and the container ends up getting that uh, in as you know the uh, as the configuration is actually be running with. Does does this help? I mean, this is obviously for various environments, but do like let's say you and I are working on a project together. Mm -hmm. Would is it do do different devs have different files? I mean, or is that kind of? Uh, they could. They could. They could. Okay. Uh, okay. It's not that often we see this. So the the cloud the cloud is the one that sort of you know. That's the one. We just call it cloud because that's what tooling gives you, like you know, right. uh, as a default. That's, that's like your thing production. When you, yeah, when yeah. you run into something like okay. remote, then we have the local stuff. That's because you can run service fabric locally on your machine. Got it. And we can emulate multiple nodes and stuff like that. Right. So there might be some specific configurations you have to do when you run uh, things locally okay. in multiple nodes. Like you can't have five instances of a service using the same port on your local machine. Right. That's not going to work. So you know, you need to you need to handle some of those stuff. Got it. That makes sense. Um, one other thing I want to point out into the manifest is you start seeing some of the stuff that you can do with uh, with these orchestration. Like we have this thing we call resource governance policy, for instance. Mm -hmm. Now, when you start, you know, running these multiple containers inside an orchestrator, like you don't want to have them run freely in terms of you know memory and CPU that's actually right. available to you. Right. You could do that, uh, but that could you know end up uh, a bit messy at one point. Okay. So what I'm what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm actually putting some governance policies around my containers. So I say, these containers, they get a gigabyte of memory and they get one CPU core. Cool. And that's what they get when they run inside. And I can, of course, adjust that, right? So in this case, I think I'm doing the same for both of my containers, but I could say, like, the front end needs more, or the back end needs uh, less, or the WCF service needs so, less. So let's say I wanted to run SQL Server inside of a container, because uh -huh. that's one of our new awesome features that we can do. Um, I think when I've seen this in the past, it says that I have to have four gigabytes of memory or four cores. I can't remember uh -huh. what the, it's for something or other. Yeah. Um, effectively, would I go in and change this based on the requirements of that particular container and what it needs? Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. So you, you, I mean, you can if you don't specify anything, the container gets to run freely. Use um, whatever you want to use, right? Chaos. Well, what I what I've seen, yeah, what I've seen is that these applications that were typically built to host in an IIS server, right. like you know, they sort of assume that you know. I have what I have, and there was sort of like yeah. this, this. Let's just kill it with yeah. iron if we had an issue, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but but maybe we want to you know control cool. a little bit more. He so you can do those kind of things. So let's see how this this thing actually uh, ends up running. Like you know, um, so here this is just the application. I just want to show yeah. that it actually is running, and okay. you know this is where I go and check in people and. If things are still up and running, that's good. You can see. So very basic, you know. There really isn't anything interesting to the application itself. But what I want to show you is the uh, the management view once this is in the orchestrator. So this is Service Fabric we have now, and you can see this this cluster that I'm connected into. It has this concept of nodes and applications and services that I have deployed. So basically, I have a cluster consisting of five nodes, that's which great. meaning yeah. five VMs, yeah. right? I have this one application deployed, and that one application is my application consisting of my web front and oh, web forms and, and my WCF application. So you can see stuff like uh, you can actually see stuff like the allocation I've done in terms of CPU and memory across my cluster. Wow. So you can go in and see like I have these two containers running now, right? And you can see on one of the nodes there's one core reserved, and another node there's another core reserved. So if I were to deploy more containers in here, you can see how they sort of lay out and the capacity I have left. So not only you know is the orchestrator using that thing to you know uh, reserve or you know assign resources, right. but it also using it to make sure that the the, the load is balanced across uh, your container. That's cool. Uh, across your cluster. What's did you click on cluster map? Yeah, I'm kind of curious. And I can do the same with memory here. So That's yeah, cool. cluster map. Then we get into the whole orchestration oh, wow. thing. This is like you know this service fabric cluster five nodes because. What these orchestrators are really about is like resiliency. Right? You right. really want to run your, make sure that we run your workload no matter what happens. So a concept uh, service fabric works in that sense is what we call fault and upgrade domains. So basically, uh, consider the five VMs we have. We sort of 
um, we put them, each of them, we distribute them across the fault domains and the upgrade domains. Now, fault domains are really tied into the underlying infrastructure in Azure. Got it. So imagine that Azure is this data center with tons of racks and there's right. like, you know, power supplies coming in and network connection coming in right. and stuff like that. Right. So it's actually physically laid out in the sense that, you know, if, 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 a, if a failure happens over here, like, you know, a physical failure of a broken thing, it okay. doesn't affect other, other, you know, areas of the data center. So got it. So, so if somebody trips over the power cord on the east side of the data center, you've got your stuff over on the west side, your yeah. stuff's still online. Exactly. That's awesome. So That's because cool. we know how Azure works, yeah. when you run these clusters in Azure, we make sure your VMs don't fall into these fault domains. So we actually That's make awesome. sure that we distribute your VMs across those failures that could happen. Oh, how very, so, how very polite of you. Yes, you're well, you're welcome. <laughs> And we have the same concept about upgrade domains. So upgrade domains we use because whenever we do a change Got to it. the cluster, if, okay. you, you know, if you throw a new version in or you have to change the configuration of the cluster mm -hmm. and stuff like that, we, we do what we call rolling upgrades, meaning that we only upgrade one domain at a time. Got it. So in this scenario, like let's say this VM number zero I have up here, like if I were to change a cluster configuration somehow, I need to you know, pull a change to upgrade the cluster itself. Right. What will happen is that we will go ahead and say, okay, let's do upgrade domain number zero. There's this one server in here. We find all the services or containers running on that server, and we tell them, hey, you need to find another place to live because I'm going to shut down this VM. So the containers start moving over to other servers. Wow. Once they're gone, we're going to upgrade that VM. And once we're done, we're going to see, you know, is everything still, you know, there's a wait period, there's yeah. sort of like a cool down. Right. Take like, let's say for the next 15 minutes, is everything still okay? Are the services running? If we bring containers back, will they come up after we've done the upgrade? And when everything's good, we move on to the next upgrade domain. Wow, that's great. So, you we know, it's, it's really, 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 from its very core, it's built to just make sure things keep running. We right? should emulate that's, that at the uh, workshop. Oh, we can, we can totally show you that. That'd be fun. We can even show you some of that now, right? Um, yeah, let me actually show you that now, now. because my application, so my, my two containers ended up in what we call an application over here. So you can see I have my registration, I have my WCF. Now, what I told my cluster is I only want one of these containers running at a time. Got it. Right? Because I, I don't need more, I don't have the load for more, or anything like that. But I can easily have it, you know, uh, run multiple. Now, I'm going to do this as a manual operation. Uh, but I could have done this like in any automated way where I were, you know, to monitor like requests or resource consumption and stuff like that. So what you can actually see now is running a node number zero. Okay. But now I've got two more containers I've been running. Awesome. And there's so one now, just lit up and then the other one's going to light up here, right? Yeah. So this one is just coming up right now, right? So you can see I now have three instances and they have names and they run across these different nodes. So I actually just scaled out that web forms application service that I was running. That's so cool. if you go back and think about if you were to do that in your own data center today, like have this IIS server, yeah. I, I need two more. Well, let's go and phone the hardware window, let's, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So this is, you know, these are the things you get, you get this yeah. thing from you. Uh, this, this reminds me of a stat. It's an old stat. I'd love to see what it looks like today. I bet uh -huh. the number's gone down because, you know, cloud adoption. Um, but I think it was 2012 and 2013, there was a study done, survey done of companies in the UK and the US um, to figure out how much money was spent like across the, you know, what, what, what happens in a data center and like what, you know, where the money goes. 72% of the money was spent, was spent on maintaining servers. Yeah. And if you think about, you just did this, you didn't call anybody. That's yep. great. No, That's no. fantastic. Yep. So that was that was you know that was that was scaling things out. Now we can try another trick. We can try to you know let's bring down one of the nodes. So let's just for the sake of you know uh, of the demo, let's just try to deactivate this and remove the data. Like it it, it basically just means in the language of service fabric, uh, don't necessarily expect this node to come down anytime soon, or don't ever expect it to come back. Right. That's that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna disable this guy, and you can see now my service that was running here on, on number. Node number zero is now gone because right. that node is gone. So it actually signaled this to, hey, we need to bring on, because you asked me to run three. Wow. So I'm going to run one on node number three that's instead. That's pretty awesome. So that's what it's going to do now. So you literally just simulated something going down and it, uh, it taking care of it and giving you the third back again. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And that took nothing. It was effortless. Yeah, that's, that's really that's awesome. It. So those are really the benefits of getting into this orchestration world. And you see how the whole operations, upgrades, and all these kind of things, uh, just requires very less, you know, a lot less involvement right, for right. a lot of people to okay. be able to do that. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, you still need to do your testing and blah, 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 all of this. Yeah. You need yeah. to do things, you know, yeah. right. But it, it yeah. just, I think the main point is it requires less involvement for a lot of people, That's you know, okay. less effort to get to that point. That's really, really great. Um, cool. 
I've, I've got like more questions now, but we, we have to end the show at some point. <laughs> um, the only other question I can think of off the top of my head is I know you've got service fabric tools. Yep. Is what's the deployment experience look like now? I've got I've got my ASP.NET app. I've got my WCF app. Mm -hmm. I'm all ready to go. Like, how would I push it up to service traffic? Like, what's so VSTS like? has a lot of great built-in, okay. uh, okay. both uh, built-in deployment templates. Because friends don't let friends right-click deploy. Exactly. Right. You know, we don't let you jump the gap, and then later you have right. to go and close right. it. We exactly. just take you on a like, nice yeah. path to get up there. Makes sense. Uh, so in Visual Studio Team Services, we actually spend uh, spend some effort to. There are specific tasks that maps into the service fabric world, right. and there are specific tasks that map into the Docker world. Got it. So the things you have to do to, you know, get from just, you know, committing whatever code I showed you over here into repository, mm -hmm. and you know, start of the build, creating the Docker containers, get them into the container registry. Right. And then from there on, you know, taking those manifest files, go and find the service fabric cluster. You could build the service fabric cluster because it's just, it's just ARM. This is there, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but handing these things over to service fabric and tell it to go and deploy those containers. There are specific tasks for those in VSTS, and there are even templates that you can just work wow, with. That's cool. Some of the stuff so. that you showed here in the uh, in the portal. Yep. Um, just a quick question: Is like. Scaling that guy up to three, is that the kind of thing that you can actually do from an Azure CLI script? Like, do you have, yeah. you do? Okay. Yeah, That's PowerShell, uh, we have PowerShell, we have CLI uh, to do all of these things, That's REST awesome. APIs. Okay. So all of that is all of that is enabled. REST APIs meaning I could write my own thing if I was feeling brave. Yeah, and this yeah. is, so this is, so once you, so once you move beyond this, right, because right. What, we, what we really just did is we took old code, or yeah, yeah. legacy or heritage code, we can even call it. Uh, you know, but we moved existing it Existing code. Existing code. Yeah. We moved it into this you know, right. wonderful modern world where we right. get all these benefits. But, but what you pr probably want to do now is like it, it enables you to easily you know, add new functionality, not by expanding the existing code right. base, but you know, trying to get into this microservice pattern, having things a little bit more decoupled. Okay. Uh, so I actually have a, have a scenario where we've done this with this application as well. Oh, cool. Let's see that. So um, if we just, let's just start back in the GitHub repo to just show you the, the idea. So the idea is we built, we ended out building this fairly complex setup here, right? Mm -hmm. So we had the existing application, web forms, WCF, and SQL database. Now just imagine this for a while that, you know, some marketing, you know, external vendor bureau was called in. Let's, you know, give me a nice web page. Let's do some Twitter sentiment analysis, right. you know. Yeah. And these guys just, you know, they're just, just a cloud thing. They pull like together functions and customers DB and, right. you know, cognitive services, right. maybe even using logic apps. Right. And they made this great web page that could show this Twitter sentiment stuff. Right. But we sort of figured out we want to use that as well in our application, right? Right. Because we wanted this back end system. We actually want to monitor for like negative sentiment. Right. And see if, you know, just, Get a nice overview of those kind of things and see if there's stuff we can we can do with that. And by the way, the sentiment analysis is another demo that we already have out there as well that you could party on. And yeah. is that actually what you guys hooked into? It's like, well, they're building that over there. Let's just hook into it, kind of idea. I think it was so easy, so we made it one ourselves. Yeah, it was. You can almost do it just by using logic apps. So you can totally do it. That's, so anyways, that's how we did it. Yeah, yeah. It's great. So so <laughs> it's not it's not like you know it's not it's, it's not, not rocket science no, at not. this point in time. So yeah. it's but it's very. Easy. So the way that we hook these things together is like we need we need a way to get that into our you know existing application right. up here. So what we did is we created a new microservices, right. just a small like integration services we call it. So we did a .NET Core Web API, which then goes and reads stuff off the Cosmos DB, which is where these analyzed uh, tweets, tweets are, yeah. and then we hook that into the web frontend. So, because I'm in a service fabric world, and the service fabric really helps you make it easy with this concept of building microservices, this is actually a progression of the same solution that I had before. Got it. But what I did is now I add what we call a reliable service in here, a service fabric microservice. Okay. And this is just a .NET Core Web API. Got it. There's a little bit of um, there's a little bit of bootstrapping code that you would have to do to sort of. So this is, this is another way of running services in Service Fabric. Now, right. when we run a container, we're sort of, from a Service Fabric point of view, the orchestrator point, we're sort of blind to what's going on inside. Right. We know there's a container, and we use, we use the Docker host to help us you know, run these, but we right. really control the lifecycle and everything. But there's another concept in Service Fabric called reliable services, right. where you don't run in a container, you actually run in a process, but, but the runtime is able to hook into your actual code and work with your okay, code. And on sense. the other side, you can, with, from within your code, work with the runtime and Got everything. It. So whereas with the first set of code, you're putting it into a container and putting the container into service fabric, you're not necessarily reaping any of the benefits of the service fabric itself. If you go this way, you can actually make use of some of that stuff. You can actually, in your logic, in the application that you build, in that logic, you can sort of hook in. You can, 
make the application aware that it's running in orchestrator, and you can hmm. sort of, you know, use that to control life cycle, things like that. That's cool. A very specific scenario there. So, so first of all, it requires you to derive from our base class. In this case, it's something we call a stateless service. Got it. So what we're going to do here is, you know, the web host builder, which is what you need in any ASP.NET Core uh, setup, we basically wrap that in what we call, you know, this method that we have that you go and override, which is the method that gives you an endpoint. That's okay. how we sort of made that integration. Main point is all of this code is being, you know, served to you by our templates. And usually, I mean, you can do stuff around whether you want to use Kestrel, HTTP issues, and all that. It's all, again, it's still just uh, ASP.NET Core. But usually, you just want to head out to your controllers and start doing whatever you want to do in your controllers. And these controllers are just ASP.NET Core controllers. controllers. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. nothing, nothing fancy Not about special, this. Yeah. But what you could do is like, you know, we had that scenario before when a server needs to be taken down and ask services to move off. Yep. Now, in this world, you can just override a method when you get these events. So you can actually, from within your code, react to those events. So you told me to shut off. I'm going to go do something now. Yeah. You cool. told me to shut off. I'm just going to let me drain my clients. Let me send them somewhere else. Nice. Once I'm done, I'll let you know, and then you can move on. That's pretty cool. So you get those sort of hooks into the orchestration, and your applications can start being built around those concepts. Wow, right? that's cool. That's cool. So, but all this is, is it's basically just a simple API we build now, and we go and, 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 and hook up with DocumentDB. Uh, so this web API, we, we deploy as a service, and then we did a simple integration from the web front, and we just put some, uh, some um, we just put a web form up, which basically goes and called the API. Got it. Right? So the, 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 the code that we added here is, you know, we use a, a proxy that's in the cluster, Got because, it. you know, as, as things move around, we right. don't have to deal with finding them. Right. So we ask the proxy to go and find it for Got us. It. So basically, we tell the proxy, go and find my web API and Got send it. this HTTP request to the web API. And, and that's, that reminds me of a conversation I had with, La with uh, Steve Lasker at one point. He said, well, you've got, we had a, an app service reaching out and talking to a bunch of containerized microservices. Yep. And he said, well, you're using the full DNS name. Why aren't you just putting the web app into the cluster? And then it can just say, I want web server or SQL server or, you know, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Because that's going to be an app service. He says, oh, that makes sense. So you yep. need the fully qualified DNS name. But it, when, once you're in, once you're all in a cluster, you just need to know, like, I want to go to web two or I want to go to service yep. A or whatever. You know? Exactly. There's this URI that specifically Got takes it. me to my, you cool. know. That's awesome. So I just create an HTTP request from this to the other service, but cool. I let the proxy figure out where it actually is. Because right. it, it can have any port and it can live on any node. Got it. I don't know and I don't care. Right. Because <laughs> it's in the cluster. Exactly. Right. That's it's awesome. So, so if we go back, and this is another cluster I have, we actually deployed this. You can you can basically see you know the same representation of what was in the solution, and I have my three services, right? Nice. So I just did an up. I, I could potentially just have upgraded the other application. I haven't done this as a different uh, right. deployment, and then added that extra service in, and now you know I have all these working together. And that that service that I added have all the same you know benefits of being able to scale and failover and all these kind of things. But what I love about this is that you didn't actually go into your original code that you'd already brought up into the cloud because effectively that code was finished. Yeah. Um, you just want to add another feature to it, but when you add that feature, you decide that you want to use cognitive services or functions or Bing Maps API or whatever the heck mm -hmm. it is. You can actually just bring in a different Azure resource and make a call to it rather than gut your code and like change everything yeah, around. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Yeah. So, so, that, so that first investment's easy. And then you can extend your application as you need mm -hmm. using all the more modern stuff that yep. you didn't have when you first built your app however many years back. Yeah, and it really depends on you know the investment that you know the app sort of can carry right. in terms of you know, do you want to do do you want to start breaking this one up? Because right. I always start breaking it up and taking functionality out of the old one, right. and, you know, wrapped in new microservices. Right. Um, or I could just do this way, like, if I need a new service, I would rather go down that path because it gives me more flexibility. That's cool. And the flexibility is mainly around, you know, scaling and upgrading, scaling independently. Now, if this was a high throughput system, it probably isn't. Yeah. <laughs> but if a lot of people wanted to talk to the APIs, uh, yeah. uh, the API that gives you the sentiment results, you could just scale that one API. You don't have to scale the whole stack. Right? Got it. Or if for whatever reason there's some news about Smart Hotel and everybody starts tweeting, then you could just scale out that one particular service. You don't have to scale the rest of the app yeah. out because that's the only thing that's going to be spinning. Yeah, that makes sense. That's yeah. cool. So love the, that. I mean, the app basically we just you know we added this extra rep form and that should be able to give us you know so and you can see Corey Dolly was, he doesn't really like Smart Hotel <laughs> <laughs> for some reason <laughs> it's Robbie's and Mishy, but there you go. I think I think I think Corey's just uh, uh, happily sarcastic most of the time. I so, think so. I think so. I think, so. So. I think that's it. <laughs> Cool. He's great. Um, this is great. Um, uh, one thing I, I want to ask you, you had mentioned like you talked to some customers who like had this kind of a style of situation. Mm -hmm. Like 
Like, tell me some of those scenarios that you've run into. I, yeah. I know you can't talk about customers, but tell me some scenarios that you've kind of hit. Well, the scenario is typically like, people really want to take those first benefits. Like really, right. you know, uh, either they want to get started on just a cloud journey or right. migration, and, and or they, you know, we have customers who like, I, I got to get out of this data center. Right. I need to shut down this data center. Where do I put my workloads? Right. And this is definitely a path they can then take, right? And we have a few customers we work with today who's, who's, who's starting these migrations now and really trying to scale them, you know, sort of setting up a little app migration factory, right. which is doing all the containerization. That's you know, cool. And there's typically a little, little small things you have to do around, you know, we talked about configuration, those right. kind of things. There's right. small tweaks and, you know, Authentication, you know, you just you just make sure that things work, you okay. know, get a, your fleet of test people set up and everything, and then you just start, you know, pumping these applications through, containerizing, and they all end up in this cluster orchestration world, which gives them all these, you know, operational benefits. Nice. Awesome. So, so a lot of customers starting to doing that right now, taking those first steps in, okay. and you know, but 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 definitely their motivation is also that they're in this cloud landscape, right? right? Right. So whenever they need to do things now, they have they have other options. It's it's just so much easier for them to reach right. out to these like you know more cloud native paths That's and awesome. doing things. That's great. And since you guys support containers and service fabric, you could you could do Python. It doesn't matter what technology is. You could just bring it, right? We can, yeah. The clusters I've shared, you know, this is .NET framework, right? right? So it has to be Windows, right? Which means it has to be Windows containers. Right. It has to be Windows uh, hosts that runs the the, right. uh, the cluster. But if it was .NET Core, you could put it on anything. Exactly. Right. And Service yeah. Fabric could run Windows, Linux. Okay. It runs anything on anything, basically. Got it. Got it. Uh, so, but yeah, you can still. I mean, we have some great scenarios where customer uh, moving Java applications into oh, wow. Windows clusters, even because they come from Windows world already, so yeah. So they're taking their existing Java code that runs on Windows servers, bringing them up and putting them into Windows containers, and putting those containers in the service fabric and basically just moving the world. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Cool. Cool. Well, this has been great. It's been fantastic. I think yeah. we've talked about service fabric maybe a dozen times. And um, I mean, no offense to the other 11 times we talked about it, this was, this was this was the best conversation we've had. Maybe you finally got it <laughs> got it in there. I got like, it. It's been, it's been <laughs> hard for cool. me to wrap my mind around it, but, but yeah. now it's, Makes makes a lot more sense. Yeah, so this, and this there's a great. lot more to that world, right? People yeah. building new microservice applications. Yeah. We even have this thing called Actor Framework that people talk about now, which is just a different way of programming these Got it. Uh, scalable applications. But there's a lot more to it than this. But the base orchestration capabilities, and this is definitely a great scenario to showcase those and start using. This them is right cool. There. This is yeah. cool. Well, this is the the next uh, next uh, chapter in the whole smart hotel uh, saga. Sorry, Corey. <laughs> um, uh, go out and watch Corey's video. We're going to have that in the show notes down below. Uh, uh, follow uh, Mikkel on uh, Twitter. We're going to have this Twitter handle in the thing below. Uh, if you're not following me, I understand. Um, but uh, it's been great. Uh, I am Robert Green. Wait, I mean, Brady Gaster. Uh, thanks a lot, Robert, for letting me host your show uh, this week. Uh, and thanks a lot, Mikkel, for coming out and uh, doing for having this. Me. It's been wonderful. Cool. Yeah, cool. Thanks, thanks a lot, guys. Take Bye. care.